Today, we are delighted to have Penny Mayfield with us to discuss and to show photographs from her new book, Live from the Mississippi Delta. Here to say a few words about Penny is Steve Yates, our friend and associate director of the University Press of Mississippi. Thank you all for coming on a uh, rainy day. Um, Penny Flout Mayfield, Clarksdale, Mississippi, is a lifelong resident of the Mississippi Delta. She's an award-winning journalist who has been photographing blues and gospel musicians at festivals, clubs, churches, and juke joints for decades. Her collections have been exhibited in museums across the United States and Europe and have earned critical acclaim from Aperture Magazine and, and many other places. She has been recognized with more than 30 awards of excellence from the Mississippi Press Association, the Associated Press, the Mississippi Film Commission, and the College Public Relations Association of Mississippi. One of my favorite reviewers from the Clarion Ledger Hattiesburg American Mississippi Books page is DeMatt Harkins. He tackles music books for us. And I love what he said about Panny's book in the Clarion Ledger Mississippi Books page. <clears throat> DeMatt writes, in her first book, Live from the Mississippi Delta, photographer Panny Flout Mayfield shares her snapshots encapsulating all of these wonderful things in the greater Clarksdale area. While the Coahoma County seat may not be a booming metropolis, the camera-wielding Mayfield frequently found herself in the right place at the right time during culturally significant events over the past 30 years. Her casual stream of consciousness photo journal lets the reader in on the energy with the perspective only a local could provide. She delivers an engaging look into multi-dimensional Clarksdale and the pleasure it holds. That's wonderful from DeMatt Harkins. Let's welcome Penny to Jackson, please. Oh, thank you so much. That's a great uh, introduction for me, and uh, I appreciate it very much because I'm a journalist. I'm usually sitting over here taking pictures, and so it's a little unusual for me to be speaking at a podium. But I, first of all, I want to thank Chris for the invitation to be here today and say how much everyone in Clarksdale is indebted to uh, archives and history for saving our historic buildings, most recently the Petraea Mansion, which was number one on Mississippi's most, uh, 10 most endangered historic buildings list. And it's thriving, and also our passenger depot, but at one time was, um, had a taxidermist in, in, in dwelling, and there were pelts, and it's a wonder that it didn't burn down, but archives and history uh, has stepped in and helped us save these buildings, so uh, it's wonderful to be a part here, and thank you so much for coming. I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the size of this crowd, but I, <laughs> thank you very much, and um, I want to thank Chris also for, um, I sent him a whole bunch of photographs, and he has put them uh, nicely in order for us, I hope, and so I will um, be showing them to you in a minute, but first of all, um, University Press has just been marvelous for the first time author, and when I first went there and spoke with Craig Gill, um, he said, you know, we like your photographs very much, but we want the stories behind them. So I went home, and I thought about it for a long time, and journalists, you know, are trained not to get involved personally in what they write about. So it was sort of like tearing the fingernails off to be able to keep from hiding behind the pictures, which is what I, most, most journalists do, and photographers, but um, uh, I uh, am, am very pleased to be here, and uh, I'm very pleased with University Press and their designers who did a wonderful job with the fonts and all the, the uh, design and arrangement of the photographs that uh, 
that worried me more than anything else. But um, in fact, the cover itself was not what I had planned. Uh, the cover of the book is a very dear friend of mine who died four or five years ago. His name is Arthur East Jones. And he was um, a great uh, harmonica player, and he was head of the Stone Gators band that was very popular in North Mississippi for, oh, probably 10 years or so. But he was, I called him a street philosopher. He just was, uh, he talked about life and what was great and what was sad. And we have, uh, I'm the publicist for the Sunflower River Blues Festival in Clarksdale. And we have acoustic stages, and we had a group of lawyers from Oklahoma who came 14 years in a row just to hear off and east play harmonica with the guitarist and talk about what what life was doing that you know that year. So uh, when he died, we we lost a great treasure, and uh, so when uh, I had uh, initially planned the cover to be from a juke joint scene uh, at the Deardrop Inn in Shelby, Mississippi, uh, other great friends of mine from the Wesley Jefferson Band that uh, were family and uh, there were, it was a place that we went every Sunday evening for one entire summer and we didn't really know a lot of people down there to start with but we, it became just something we did every Sunday night, and so I had planned that particular group of people in action, and you'll probably see that in this collection, but um, the designer at University Press um, sent me an email with this cover picture on it, and I broke down and cried because it was so perfect for, to represent uh, all the talent and music and wonderful people that I had grown to know in the last four years of covering blues events and gospel events. But uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Tutwala, which was a busy railroad town about 15 miles south of um, Clarksdale. And although I had uh, grown up hearing about places like Lula May's Sunrise Cafe, it was strictly off limits to me. I had never went, never went inside. Instead, I was uh, had a very um, wonderful childhood growing up. We would go to the picture show on Friday nights and watch Randolph Scott uh, every Friday and sometimes on Sunday. And we played kick the can, and it was just an idyllic type situation. And so um, um, I was. Um, Got involved with photography when, photography when I was about 12 years old, and it just sort of hooked me for uh, the rest of my life. And um, Charlie Muscle White writes about how blues uh, captured him when he was just a little boy. Well, photography did that for me. And I grew up in um, Tutwala, and I was uh, editor of the local high school newspaper. And when I went to Ole Miss, I studied journalism and photography under the great Dr. Gerald Forbes, who was a great photographer. And we spent hours and hours and hours in dark rooms um, processing film and so forth. So um, I was editor of the Mississippi and at Ole Miss. So I um, started my career in journalism. And, and um, I was not involved in really blues or music in, in particular. I just was interested in people. So. Um, I'm just telling you kind of the way it happened to me, so I hope you'll appreciate that this is most uh, most informal uh, rendering of how I kind of got into this. Um, I was asked by Wesley Jefferson, who had the Southern Soul Band, to take some photography pictures um, for their band because they were local and they needed to have some gigs. So I went down to Margaret's Blue Diamond on railroad tracks in Clarksdale and took a bunch of pictures of his band there. And then later on, I helped Super Chicken Johnson put together a portfolio. Some of you may be familiar with Super Chicken. He's quite a performer. But um, I had uh, become friendly with um, Wesley Jefferson's band and Michael James, who was a wonderful guitarist, and his lady, May. Um, and so she began teaching me how to dance 
rooms uh, in her kitchen uh, with a radio. Um, so it was, it was not something I had considered myself growing up to be a great dancer. Not, you know, not professional, but we all danced. And I went all over the Delta when I was growing up dancing to the Red Tops. And uh, we danced in high school gyms, and we danced in Rosedale at the courthouse at Christmas time. And we danced at the Elks Club in Greenwood. And it was just part of, uh, part of life in the Delta when I was growing up. But what May was doing in her kitchen, listening to the radio, was not anything that I knew anything about. Her, her body moved in an entirely different way. It was not the Memphis shuffle that I had known. So gradually, I, uh, I really got, uh, my body never moved the way that hers did. <laughs> but anyhow, I started going down to blues clubs uh, at night on the weekend and um, by myself. And so uh, it was not something that a lot of people did my age. And so I just gradually went and I became part of the woodwork and I always had a camera with me and I was welcomed and, and it was just an amazing uh, new life for me that absolutely changed my life. So uh, I'm gonna stop this narrative for a minute and start telling you, showing you some photographs, but um, um, I went back to Tawala um, in 2009 with a very famous friend of mine that I had met through uh, photography and music, and his name is Robert Plant, who's a front man for Led Zeppelin, and um, uh, Tawala is, is actually considered the birthplace of the blues by many people because um, W.C. Handy heard blues performed there outside the depot in 1903. He was sitting, uh, he lived in Clarksdale and had a band there and so he was down and he heard this guy playing slide guitar with a kitchen knife and it hooked him. And from there, you know, blues spread all over the world. And so Robert Plant is a wonderful um, friend, and he's a great historian of blues music and many kinds of music. So um, through the years, the people in Tutwiler were sort of um, unhappy because they didn't have a blues trail marker, and so many other places did have blues trail markers. And I, um, Robert came down, I, I, well, I'll tell you that story later, but um, I think he mentioned it was a stream of consciousness type thing, and this is a stream of consciousness type talk. But anyhow, I got to meet Robert Plant uh, by sheer luck. I was in the Blues Museum almost 20 years ago. Uh, I was in there a lot, and uh, the Blues Museum was founded in... Uh, of the late 70s, and by Sid Graves, who was uh, a librarian there in Clarksdale. So I happened to be there when uh, two uh, visitors came in, and lots of visitors often came to the Blues Museum. And um, I, it was Robert Plant and Jimmy Page, and they were on tour of the uh, Plant Page tour all over, the, all over the United States. And so I was showing them some um, CDs of local musicians, and uh, we began talking, and Robert said, uh, do you know anybody that might be able to show us around, you know, some of the local places here? And I said, yeah, I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that started a friendship that has just continued now for a long time. And uh, so I was telling Robert on one of the trips he came to Clarksdale, Clark about Tutwala and that I was from there and how unhappy the people were, there, were that they didn't have a blues trail marker. And I said, well, if they don't have a chamber of commerce or a tourism commission, then he was listening to that and he said, we'll take care of that. So about three years later, he called me from Nashville and he said, do you think we could do it uh, Thanksgiving? And I said, I believe we can. <laughs> So I got in touch with uh, the people that uh, were in charge of all the Blues Trail markers. I can't remember who that was right now, but um, uh, Robert agreed not only to unveil a Blues Trail marker there in Tuckwala, which has 
now has about 800 residents. He agreed to pay for the whole thing, but his one provision was that he did not want any advanced publicity whatsoever. So uh, that was a little difficult, but um, I'll just jump in right there. I was back at home in Tutwala introducing uh, Robert to a group of senior citizens. There were about um, maybe 30 people there in the railroad park, and they didn't have a clue who he was. <laughs> they said they knew that he was responsible for their getting the Blues Trail marker, and they had made pimento cheese sandwiches, <laughs> and they had fruit punch. <laughs> and so um, it, was just, um, it was just an amazing thing uh, that he stood up and talked and, and told them how important Tutwala was in music history. And then, of course, in uh, 2003, the, the Congress uh, declared that the centennial of the uh, anniversary of the birthplace of the blues. But anyhow, I'm going to uh, quit talking now and start showing you some pictures. And I think the first one here is, um, Chris, I hope I'm doing this right. This is... This is Robert. Um, I think this was the first time I took him down there. And these are murals that were um, created by Christian Barnard, who is a very ta talented artist who does many, many um, covers for many blues festivals. And uh, I took Robert and Jimmy Page uh, to Tutwala, and this this depicts the um, Debbie C. Handy listening to a blues musician playing outside the depot. I hope, I, I hope I've been heard. I, this is the first time. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, um, this is Robert again, and Jimmy Page that year, and I think it was uh, 98. And this is the birth, this is the gray site for Sonny Boy Williamson, who was a very famous musician and a harmonica player. And a, quite a dandy. Uh, he wore a derby hat, and he's uh, actually the sort of the uh, patron saint of the King Biscuit Blues Festival in Helena. And uh, I have taken many, many people there to, to this grave site. It's about two miles out of Tutwala on a very uh, lonely road. And um, Robert has been there so many times. He's taken his. He's come back and brought his son and various members of the family. And so um, Jimmy was interested, but not as much as uh, Robert. And uh, this is, um, let's see. This is another picture that actually was taken in my house uh, on a trip that Robert made to Parksdale. <coughs> and he asked me beforehand uh, if Morgan Freeman would be around, and I said, well, we probably can find out. So I talked to uh, Bill Luckett, who is the former mayor of Clarksdale, and also sort of uh, has grown up to be a very close friend of Morgan Freeman. And of course, you all know we, Morgan is probably one of the best actors anywhere in any time. And so uh, they each wanted to meet each other. So we did that in my house, and we had a bunch of we had uh, probably about a dozen people there because both of these people are so accustomed to being mobbed by crowds. And there, I don't remember what they were talking about there, but um, Morgan, of course, is um, one of the part owners of the Ground Zero Blues Club in Clarkstown. And uh, he's, he and Bill got to know each other. Um, Morgan was building a house for his mother in Charleston, and. Um, was very unhappy with the contractors, so um, Bill Luckett has put himself through law school painting and doing construction work. Not that he uh, needed to do that, but that's that's what he did. He's an excellent uh, carpenter, and um, so he went over and he helped Morgan with the house in Charleston for his mother, and then later on a house of his own. So they are very very close friends. So. Um, um, I've kind of gotten off key, but 
This is the rambling part. <laughs> and this is what uh, I think has intrigued some of the people that tried to review my book because it's, it's, it's um, a rambling sort of book, but it does have some content to it and some organization, and I'll get to it a little closer if I can punch the right button here. Okay, um, my book is divided in the very first part about Robert and his being in Tutwala and my growing up days there. The next part of the book is about landscapes in the Delta, which has always intrigued me, though I have lived there all my life. It's just, um, to me, it's a, a, a beautiful place. People from the hills miss the hills and everything. People in the Delta love the flat, flat lands. And so this is a picture I took inside Winfield Chapel, which is no longer there, but it used to be the chapel where Sonny Boy uh, Williamson was buried. And that shows, um, to me, a lot about the Delta and a lot about how isolated people often are. And, um, and I don't know whether it's beautiful you or not, but it, it is to me... Um, Uh, and landscapes are also very important to our, our musicians. And this picture was taken in, in 94, and this is Alan Lomax sitting on the steps in the suit. And he is, of course, one of, one of the greatest folk artists that we've ever had, I guess, in the United States. And he's listening to a blues musician named Fruitland Jackson. Uh, he, uh, he and his father came to the Mississippi Delta in the 1930s and 40s uh, recording, they were actually looking for, they were looking for um, Robert Johnson, and I'm sure you've all heard of Robert Johnson, but they, they heard, um, they, instead they heard Muddy Waters and they did record him, but um, they were not welcome in the Delta by the landowners there because they had plantations and they didn't want people um, to stir up any kind of trouble on their plantations. Now, Alan um, was very, very interesting in this conversation that he gave. Uh, this is outside the, the Blues Museum and the Carnegie Library in Parksdale. And he talked about how Cahoma County, Mississippi was very similar to Senegal, where uh, people, where blues actually came, uh, started. And he said because people lived in kingdoms, and plantations in the Mississippi Delta at that time were like kingdoms, and their people were oppressed. And he talked about how, uh, actually, uh, he talked about how he and his father had to get a pass to put on their car that gave them permission to come to these plantations because their car had been shot up. It was not. Uh, it was. Not, it was not a friendly thing at all. It was not tourism in, at all. You know, but it, he played music of uh, field hollers in Senegal that he had recorded in Africa, and he played them in, in from Cahoma County, and the similarity was astonishing. So. He got me to thinking a lot about isolation and how it might have motivated a lot of musicians uh, into creating music with a diddly bow nailed on the front porch of their houses. So that's a little thing that I, I kind of got interested in. And I have talked to um, Uh, Norwegians who come to the Delta that live in lonely mountain sides. And this is a picture of the Muddy Waters cabin that I took on a winter day. And he lived here, of course, it, this is now, it was at that time. And he lived out nine miles from Clarksdale. And he was a tractor driver on the Stovall Plantation. So, um, this isolation uh, has given the uh, 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 interest in a lot of people who live in isolated places. This is a wonderful lady named Elmer, and she had a country store in Minna City, and I've probably passed it a jillion times, but 
Well, one time I stopped and went in there and talked to her, and she was a very interesting lady, and she's a, a, one of the persons that I profiled a little bit. Profile sounds so uh, structured, it was not really like that, but anyhow. How she uh, felt about uh, living in Men out from Minnesota City. Um, I'm not doing well with the pictures. Uh, the, the landscapes of the Delta have also had very early blues markers. This one um, was started by a gentleman named uh, Skip Henderson, who was from New Jersey. And he was one of the first persons that uh, recognized a lot of blues musicians that had had no recognition. And this, um, this is Kenny Brown that has, is helping this lady who is uh, Mrs. Joe Callick, her name was Doll, up to a marker that she was, I think you can see in this particular picture how touched they were to see it for the first time because her husband was a very early blues musician that lived near Memphis and recorded and had had no recognition. So um, Skip Henderson had... Um, the marker made and had it installed there, and he did that for a number of other. This is another picture of an isolated family that lived. I had some postcards made at Parchman Penitentiary, and I had been down there to, to check on them, and coming back, I, I saw this scene on the side of, as I was driving by, and I just did a, I just did a 180. I turned around and, and took this picture. And it's, I call it summertime, and I don't know whether you can see that it, uh, the, the billy goat is chewing on watermelon vines, and it was not a posed picture at all, it just happened, and it's just one, that, uh, one of my photographs that I like a lot. Um, uh, here's another scene of a small uh, plantation church out from Stovall, Mississippi, that's... Um, I, I got out in the field of cotton, and uh, these churches, of course, um, served also as schools for many um, children that went that um, lived on the plantations. Um, Honey Boy Edwards is one famous one that went to school out from uh, Clarksdale to Anderson Plantation. I'm sorry. Uh, this is another marker, a landscape, uh, a part of the Delta landscape. This is for Memphis Mini. This is out from Walls near um, Tunica, between Tunica and Memphis. And Memphis Mini was, of course, a famous early blues musician who was somewhat risque. And uh, these are members of her family. And this is her biographer. And um, this is one of the before the blues markers were created by the state of Mississippi. Um, this was very interesting, and she was um, um, was not welcomed by, really by members of her family uh, for, for um, really in churches. So it was sort of a rare thing to have her uh, recognized that day. And, <coughs> Okay, we've got kind of done a jump right there. Uh, this is the uh, Westman Jefferson Band. This is the first place that I went to do photographs for the Westman Jefferson Band. This is Margaret's new, uh, Blue Diamond. And uh, these were very good friends of mine. And um, this is Wesley on, way on the end. And these are members of his band. And that place still exists, though it doesn't have live music, but it... Um, I've taken many uh, people in there to hear that, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble with this. Okay. Um, do we skip one? Yeah. Okay. All right. No. Okay. I'll go back to that. Uh, the book. After I talked about landscapes, and those were just some pictures from that. I, the next section was called um, Homegrown Icons. These are people that were um, 
friends of mine and famous people in, in Clarksdale and in the Delta who did so much to encourage uh, today's great interest in uh, blues music. And this, this gentleman is named Early Wright. He was the first African-American DJ in Mississippi. And he broadcast um, a radio program uh, five nights a week for four hours. Uh, t the first two hours were, um, were blues and the second two hours were gospel. But he interviewed many famous people. He interviewed uh, Muddy Waters, <coughs> Uh, Elvis Presley, Ike Turner, Ike Turner worked at this radio station, WROX in Clarksdale, and this, um, he was an amazing person. He had, he never recorded his um, advertisements and they were, uh, they were wonderful. They were just, you'll have to read the book to find them, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay. And this, is, excuse me again. Uh, this is another good friend of mine who, his name is Johnny, Mr. Johnny Billington, and he was a great master teacher of, uh, he, he uh, taught kids to play all the instruments, and he was, he was stern with the discipline, as you can see in that particular picture. That young man is, um, is um, concerned about, <laughs> to say the least. But uh, Mr. Johnny um, probably taught most of the professional musicians in Clarksdale to play blues, and he also taught the kids a lot more than music. He taught them how to uh, dress properly when they performed and how to be proud of what they were doing. And so um, he, um, he, he began to get recognition as a teacher, and he uh, was connected with the Blues Museum. And he wound up taking, getting invitations to the Kennedy Center in Washington. And also, uh, Bill uh, Clinton, President Clinton, came to Clarksdale um, in 1999 on a poverty tour. And he heard about how good these kids were, and they performed all over. And he didn't get a chance to hear them when he was in Clarksdale, but he invited them to come to Washington the next um, year. It was his last year in office. And so I, as a journalist, I, I had covered the blues kids everywhere they went, and they, um, they, were, uh, they were very, very good. And so we went to the White House. And it was the most amazing thing you can imagine that they performed up there and were very well applauded. And um, and then uh, then the Marine Band came in and they started playing dance music. And we started dancing underneath those portraits of George Washington. <laughs> Crazy, I don't know, this is amazing. But anyhow, since then, uh, today's blues kids that are in today's uh, Delta Blues Museum also went to the White House um, with uh, and were applauded in the East Room uh, with Michelle Obama, and they had uh, a wonderful time there. Um, this lady is Miss Z.L. Hill, and she um, owned the Riverside Hotel in Parksdale, and some of you may know what the Riverside Hotel is. It used to be uh, the G.T. Thomas uh, hospital where Bessie Smith died in 1937. She was injured, um, fatally injured, in an automobile accident. Um, and uh, Edward Albee wrote a play about the death of Bessie Smith, which is uh, I've never seen performed. But anyhow, it was uh, uh, many, many people um, come to the Riverside Hotel and want to stay there because um, Bessie Smith was operated on there and she died there at the, at the, um, when it was a hospital. And um, John F. Kennedy Jr. Has been, um, was a, a guest at the Riverside Hotel and many, many musicians lived there when this lady, uh, Mrs. Hill, took over the, the um, hospital and turned it into a boarding house. And she's, she, this is a, uh, Bessie Smith recordings there. And that's her son Frank, who is just, they're both are deceased, but um, 
she was a, an entrepreneur that was um, welcomed people from all over the world to come. If people came from Japan, couldn't speak English at all, and they'd meet them at the bus station and she'd take them to barbecues and ball games and stuff. And just a, a wonderful, outgoing person. And um, she also, um, she used to swear that she, she made Rocket 88 ties for Ike Turner when they <coughs> recorded Rocket 88, which is supposedly the first blue rock and roll song, uh, recording. And um, I went to her funeral, um, and a lady got up and started talking about how amazing um, Everybody called her ZL. I didn't. We called her Mrs. Hill, of course. But that uh, when the trucks from the, all the plantations would come by in Clarksdale to pick up choppers and people to pick cotton, that, that she was never there. But she was always there in the afternoon when they came back to sell them peanuts and stuff. She was quite a, a wonderful businesswoman. So uh, she's another one of my. Um, homegrown icons because she had great influence on blues and the interest in blues today. Uh, this is Wade Walton who was a barber and also a blues musician. He played harmonica and he uh, recorded a blues uh, album in uh, the 1950s. He was picked up by some students from California and taken uh, all the way up to New Jersey to record it. And um, he was a storyteller, and, and um, people used to go. This this gentleman there in his chair was um, a railroad man, and some people had never had their hair cut by anybody um, but Wade. And uh, he was um, he was a great uh, promoter of blues and music in, in Mississippi. Uh, this is Bill Clinton when he came to uh, Clarksdale in 99, I believe it was, and uh, that's uh, Congressman Thompson with him there, and the mayor of Clarksdale then was uh, Richard Webster. Uh, and this is the New Roxy, which is in was a theater um, in the New World District, which was a a uh, wonderful area that has fallen on hard times and then has come back and is now having a revival as a blues, um, a very blues, popular blues venue. That's us in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> this is John Rusky, um, who at the time was a uh, curator of the Blues Museum. You can you can see we had a wonderful time. Uh, this is another um, musician who was not from the Delta. This is Otha Turner from uh, Gravel Springs, Mississippi, near uh, Senatobia. And of course, that's Miss Fordyce. And this is Bernice, his daughter. And uh, Otha, of course, had the Drum and Fife Band, the uh, Rising Star. And they were performing at the Governor's Awards in the old Capitol there. Were, were you there, Chris? I wasn't. You weren't? Okay. I used to go to all of them, and I, I think they're wonderful celebrations. And a whole section of my book is about, uh oh, here I go again. Um, here we go, sorry. Uh, a lot of music has always gone around, been popular in Clarksdale. We had a city, we have a city auditorium that used to have wonderful blues shows, and I, I love going. But this was not one of them. This was at uh, Isle of Capri Casino, and this, of course, is James Brown. And um, I had uh, contacted his manager and gotten permission to come up and attend the. Uh, sound check for this show and to interview James Brown and I went and uh, I was there about three hours and the band was one of the best bands I've ever heard anywhere. It, they had three drum sets. It was just an amazing band and um, then James Brown came in and it was just hushed. It was just, he, he, he just tore them up. He made them practice over and over and over, and the vocalist. 
He was a complete tyrant. I'm just, <laughs> just, I've never seen anything like it. And so uh, when it was over, uh, he left. He was a tiny little man, and he had on high heel boots and stuff. And so when he went, it was just like Moses parting the red sea. Walked out like that. It was just amazing. And so then I waited around because the show was not that much later on. And when he came back. This is the face he showed. You know, it was just couldn't be more um, delightful. And people danced all up on the stage and everywhere. It's one of the best things I have ever, ever attended. Uh, this is Luther Dickinson, who is uh, the North Mississippi All Stars and one of the Burnsides playing at the Sunflower River Blues Festival in Clarksdale, which just celebrated its 30th anniversary. And this is um, the, uh, an outdoor scene when Robert Plant came for our 25th anniversary, and it was the biggest crowd of people I have ever laid my eyes on. And uh, uh, this is another. This is uh, Luther Allison, who is um, who, who is just he was he was everybody's favorite, and I believe this particular picture was taken in Norway of all places, who is our sister city of Clarksdale, and they have wonderful blues festivals, and this is Luther there. This, this is the section of the book on festivals and, all, and celebrations. This is Albert King at the King Biscuit Blues Festival, and I've always liked that picture because of the, in the background is the logo of King Biscuit, who is uh, Sonny Boy Williamson, who is buried out from Tuckmallow. Uh, this is a uh, Sunflower a wonderful festival we had that had little Milton with the guitar, and this is Ike Turner, who is from Clarksdale, and it was a truly amazing thing. And of course, B.B. King's homecoming celebrations every year were so much fun. It was uh, They always took place in uh, the end of May, it was either on Friday, the end of May, or the 1st of June. And he truly was Mississippi's greatest ambassador to me. He just—he was—he uh, always had kids that got up on the stage with him, and he, they would dance, and they just had the best time. And he did these concerts for free. And this is uh, a one that the BBC recorded. I think it was the first one I went to. But uh, they were in a park there in Indianola, and it's just another of the celebrations. Um, this is from um, ZZ Top, who is an uh, international icon who raised a million dollars for uh, the Delta Blues Museum in Clarksdale. And this was taken at the uh, uh, Peabody Hotel on the Skyway uh, on a Grammy night. And these young ladies were from Ole Miss, and they always had lots of blondes around. Uh, this is uh, Billy Gibbons. The, uh, guitarist, of course, with ZZ Top, and uh, in the middle is Sid Grace, who founded the Blues Museum, and uh, the other person is Jim O'Neill, who is the uh, co-founding editor of Living Blues Magazine, and this is the Money Waters Cabin when it was out uh, on Stovall Plantation. Another international icon is Charlie Musselwhite, who's been uh, playing harmonica there with the blind boys from uh, Alabama. And I took this over at the Ford Center at Ole Miss. And uh, there's a story about how they happen to be together. It's in the book that I won't take time to get into. Um, these are, um, <laughs> these ladies are the I guess. <laughs> and they had a, they had a dress rehearsal in one of the clubs that cost out. You couldn't get near the building, but it was just unbelievable. They had on spandex suits that were just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Ike with, with his back. And uh, I got to know him later and uh, spent some time with him. And I know that he's had a lot of, had a lot of pre bad press. And he was absolutely charming. I just couldn't get over how nice he was. But this is Bobby Rush, who you all know from from uh, he's from here in Jackson, and uh, Bobby Rush is um, I've known for a long, long time. He's a good friend of mine, and some people are horrified by his shows, but 
he, he likes it all of it, and we all know him, and so we've all tried to get him to let us audition to be on his <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, anyhow, this is an early, early picture at uh, one of the Sunflower Blues festivals. And this is a picture I took at the Blues Music Awards in Memphis of um, Bobby and Little Milton. And um, the Blues Music Awards, they used to be called the Handies, and I don't know why they changed it, but... Um, these are the Jelly Roll Kings. This is um, this was um, taken at a, a club called not even a club. It was the Bobo Grocery Store way. In Bobo. <laughs> and this is um, Sam Carr on the left, and seated is Frank Frost, and the, the guitarist is Big Jack Johnson. And this was a segment that was uh, filmed for River of Song, a Smithsonian documentary. And uh, they were good friends. And we, um, we used to go out there and we would dance around pickle jars and stuff. It was just so much fun. It burned down and then they rebuilt it and then somebody, <coughs> somebody was shot in the building so it's no longer a club. Um, this is apparently, I just jumped into one on juke joints because um, this is the Bobo Grocery and this is um, um, the star of the show, Robert Bilbo Walker, uh, on the right hand side. And you can see they had, um, it was a real grocery store, it was not just a, but um, on weekends, when Robert came from California, we all went out there and danced and had a great time. And this is the Deardrop Inn. This is the group that I actually wanted on the cover, not this particular picture, but um, another one. Um, this is the picture that I had thought would be the cover because they were, they were such dear friends of mine, and I just... Um, this is May who taught me to tried to teach me to dance. <laughs> um, and the, the lady in the middle is Christine, who is Super Chicken's sister. And Rip Butler is the vocalist there. And on the floor is Michael James. Um, this is Hobson Plantation uh, Commissary. This is Boogaloo Ames playing piano and Kenny Neal. Uh, this, these are all the, the, the final part of the... Um, this is, I call this the steamy couple, and uh, a lot of people, this was a little club that was open on a holiday in Shelby, and this is steamy couple two. <laughs> it was the most amazing couple dancing you can imagine. Uh, this is another, this is Super Chicken's um, brother, Ellis Coleman, who's a marvelous dancer, and this is Red's. Uh, blues Club in Clarksdale, which has been voted uh, one of the top blues clubs in the United States. And so you all must come and see it because it's... Uh, I've got to tell this a little story real quick because I'm, I'm realizing I'm near the end. But this was from the Governor's Awards. This is uh, Sam Carr, my great drummer friend, and part of the Jelly Roll Kings. And he and uh, the Governor, Haley Barber, had the best time talking because um, Sam was part of the house band at Conway Twitty's Club on Moon Lake. And the governor was a student at Ole Miss who was recruiting bands to play uh, uh, in fraternity parties. So they, they, they had a lot to talk about. And then, um, uh, I'm going to see what the next picture is. This is Sam. Um, he, he was one of the honorees at the Governor's Award, but I, later on at the Governor's Mansion for that reception, um, Sam, who was really a very shy person, was just kind of uh, lionized. People came up and I was so thrilled that they uh, appreciated his talent and uh, they wanted his autograph and they just kept him occupied the, the entire time. So after it, um, before we went to this reception, which is it took place at the Capitol Inn right across the street, uh, I said, um, Sam, um, what did you think of the governor? And he said, which one was he? <laughs>